Su Cheung originally hails from the Midlands and grew up constantly scribbling and drawing. She won a scholarship to London College of Fashion, after which she moved into advertising, becoming an art director, before deciding to design on a freelance basis, also writing and illustrating children's books. She has recently released her debut children's novel, Chinglish, a semi-autobiographical account of her own adolescence as a first-generation Brit growing up in 1980s Coventry, above her parents' Chinese takeaway. She came into the reading corner to chat about the stories behind her new book with Nikki Gamble. I wonder if we could start by, because this isn't your first writing, you've actually been a writer of children's picture books under a different name. I have, So yes. tell us a little bit about your background. Right, well, I actually am from an advertising background and I moved from London to Bournemouth to actually um, put some time aside to actually do some picture books. So that's something that I've wanted to do for a long time and I've collected loads of ideas in a big heap. So then I think it was about 2011 or 12, I um, published my first children's picture book under the name of Sue Pickford, because that's my married name. And uh, since then I've done about, I think there's four picture books now. My, my late last one is actually a mindfulness for children's book because I'm very into my meditation and everything like that as well. I mean, my background is primarily it's in illustration um, and design and uh, writing has actually just come after that. Um, but only because, uh, I mean, writing's been a real passion of mine since I was a child, but it kind of came to a bit of a standstill when I was in my third year senior and the teacher pulled me to one side and asked me if English was my first language. And I said, yes, well, why is that? And she said, because the story that you've just handed in is terrible. <laughs> Probably not in those words, but it sounded like that. And, and that really put me off writing after that, up until I published my first picture book, which is a very long time mm. to have been put off. So when I um, wrote this, uh, my first novel uh, for older children, I still felt like I wasn't quite up to scratch with my writing and whether it would be good enough. But I think since the proofs have been sent out to bloggers and reviewers, I've had some very good responses, so I'm quite pleased about that. Mm. I, I think um, once the book is published, you'll never again feel that you can't write. And in any, any case, a writer that writes a picture book, every single word has to count in those short texts. It, it does. So it's not a lesser writing task no. by any stretch of the imagination. No, absolutely not. Yeah, no, you're right, actually, because in some ways it's harder because you have to edit it down so much it's got to fit within a thousand words or less. I mean, they're two different, different disciplines, mm. really. And a really good reminder, actually, uh, for all of us who work in education about how a comment perhaps said just in passing maybe, how uh, damaging that can be to oh, the, yeah, the psyche and you know our belief in what we can and can't do. Yeah, especially when a child and when you take those kind of um, comments on board as a child and then they just get, kind of get etched into your brain and uh, they just get kind of worse and worse as you get older and then you just start believing in it. Yeah. Let's come to uh, Chinglish then, which says an almost entirely true story. Yeah. And perhaps we'll get on to the truth side of it uh, in a little while but can you set the story up for us first of all yeah sure so it's actually set in uh, the early eight, early to mid 80s in Coventry in a Chinese takeaway which is where I lived with my family and I started work there as well when I was just coming up to my teens and before that before we lived in the takeaway we actually had a butcher's and a, a Chinese restaurant so um, we'd always kind of, my parents had always run their own sort of food related businesses and this story is kind of like my formative years so they're the years that I kind of like remember the most really, they're the most kind of colourful years um, and I have one younger sister, uh, an older brother and I've got a younger brother that kind of appears later on in the story so there's four of us and it's all about how my parents kind of cope with trying to run a Chinese takeaway because it's, it's very hard work. They only had like one day off a year, which was Christmas Day. Uh, we never had any holidays. We were kind of like just left to kind of amuse ourselves really until we were old enough to kind of get roped into work. And it's kind of just set in the, the area where we lived and where our friends lived. Uh, and our, we had cousins and our grandparents lived a couple of streets over. So, you know, just a little vignette of, mm. uh, of mm. our lives in Coventry at that 
point in time. Mm. Yeah. I have to say that as an adult reading this, I was completely fascinated and drawn in and hooked from right early on in the book. Um, as time went on, it emerged that it wasn't the story that I necessarily was expecting, and we'll come on to some of that. But to begin with, we should say that it's written in diary format, so it kind of fits within that genre of kind of confessional diary writing. Yes. And very, very funny, you know, very humorous. And I think one of the things that absolutely hooked me was the detail of what it was like to live and work within a Chinese takeaway. Every single community that you can think of in the UK has one of these. And often there isn't a sense of a Chinese community around that mm. unless you go to somewhere like Chinatown. Yes. We're in the middle of London here. Yeah, it, yes. It's almost That's isolated. Right. Is that is that true? Do you think? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'll um, explain the diary format. So because it spans quite a few years, and because it's my first novel, it actually helped me kind of break down parts so that I could work on it more easily. The other reason was that um, back in the eighties, one of my biggest influences back then when I was reading was um, Sue Townsend and Adrian Mould, and I absolutely love her works. One of my favourite. They're my favourite books still. Um, so it's kind of like a nod to Adrian Marlin. I believe that um, I was very like him and that I actually thought and spoke like him and because I was like the outcast as well and I was a bit of a geek. So that's um, why I kind of uh, ended up doing it in the diary format. As for the Chinese community, when I was growing up, I actually thought that um, we were the only people in the entire country that owned a Chinese takeaway and that we lived above the shop and why, it was so unfair and why did we have to do that? But because our parents didn't really communicate with us so we never really got any of our background or their journey over here to Britain from Hong Kong when they immigrate, emigrated over. We didn't really know any of that and I didn't really do any of my own research into that either because I spent most of my time just trying not to be Chinese because it was just so painfully embarrassing because... I just wondered why my parents had come over to Britain and just become more Chinese when all I wanted to do was blend in and become more English. But there we were, in a Chinese takeaway, selling Chinese food and looking really Chinese, and I just couldn't hide from that. And it was just so painfully uh, mortifying. But when I was doing my research for Chinglish, it was only then, and I'm 48 now, so that's a long time not to know this, that, um, you know, post-war Britain was when... Britain opened up to the um, British colonies and the Hong Kong Chinese came over um, due to labour shortage and all that kind of thing. But when they did come over, it was to work in the catering industries. So it was Chinese restaurants and Chinese takeaways. And um, I don't know of any exceptions, really. I think most of them did that. And then they spread out so that there weren't any competition. So that's why you f you'll find Chinese takeaways and restaurants in almost every town in Britain. And that's why they, they hadn't they didn't form a communities and one of the reasons for that as well was because there was a lot of above the shop living which is what we did so all the downstairs was converted into the takeaway the shop the kitchen and the upstairs was the living quarters and there wasn't really an opportunity to actually escape the premises the building to then mingle with the wider community and make friends and socialize you were basically stuck in the building the whole time and I knew that from just watching my parents mm -hmm. so they'd get up at sort of 11 12 uh, work a 12 hour day and then when the shop closed sometimes they'll go to the casino because that was the only thing that was open at that time and that's why you'll see a lot of Chinese people in the casinos um, but obviously the drawback to that is that you do end up sometimes losing a lot of your hard-earned money mm. uh, the profit that you work so hard to make and that's what happens um, to my um, parents so yeah, it was a very difficult kind of... And, and I'm not quite sure if it's still currently like that. I mean, because I'm first generation. Um, so all of the first generation British Chinese now that I know have got Western jobs and none of them run Chinese takeaways. I mean, because we were then educated enough to, to then leave that kind of industry. But I, I still wonder who are these people that are running... Chinese takeaways that exist today mm, mm. and what are the stories behind them I, I, I don't really I still don't know I'm still blind to it mm. you know I think one of the things that really comes across is all the preparation what a grind yeah. you know that is 
and surely these days it must come packaged up for red there's so many restaurants you yeah. would expect the onion would come ready chopped yeah wouldn't you <laughs> yes that's actually yeah that's very true and you'd hope that that was the the, the case because back then um yeah we had to do all the prepping well, i'd come back from school and it would be peeling chopping onions which was a really horrible job obviously because it was just it's I, as I put in the book, I didn't know whether it was because I was crying from the onions or crying because I hated my life <laughs> right then. Um, had to chop the mushrooms. And the prawns. And peel the prawns and gut the prawns, which is disgusting. <laughs> uh, I even had to, um, you know, in the summer, and this is, I don't know if this happens now, I'm not quite sure, but we used to have bins outside and in the summer, the flies would get in and then it would be absolutely crawling with maggots and it would be my job in the in the evening when the sun went down and only the, only the kitchen lights were on the maggots would actually be drawn to the lights coming from the kitchen and start working their way into the kitchen i'd have to stand at the bin and kill them all before they got anywhere near the kitchen with boiling water and and, and bleach and all that kind of thing um so yeah i was given some really horrible jobs i mean but that still wasn't as bad as when i had to first start serving customers mm. i absolutely hated that mm. because because i was trying to hide Mm-hmm. from being so Chinese and then I was put front of counter, front of shop at the counter where mm-hmm. everybody could see me and everyone walking past could look in and see me or my and potentially school. people you know yeah at school and everything mm-hmm. you know not that I had that many friends but you know people would recognize me from school and then you know all the bullying that went on at school as well I would think well that's just going to get worse if mm-hmm. they see me here and that kind of um, twinned with the whole teen angst that anybody gets no matter what background you're from mm-hmm. um just compounded everything and just made it so much worse Mm. but this isn't a gloomy book and it's not a gloomy read and that's because of your voice which actually has got this strong humorous tone yes how much of that was quite a fragile humor uh, a coping humor well yeah so i didn't really even sort of analyse this until I was writing the book when I started putting anecdotes together that I would always tell at parties and people would always laugh so I'd always used to kind of just um, bring them out you know whenever I could so when I first started writing the book and really sort of started thinking about why I was telling these stories in this way when actually my life wasn't really that funny it was because I was using humour as a coping mechanism and I'd done that all of my life without realising because I think if I hadn't, I would have just been so depressed. Um, so it, it kind of made me into this natural comedian and whenever I'd get together with anybody, I'd be like the, the one that told all the jokes and everything because I could always make a bad situation into a good one. I always saw the funny side of things and that's as a result of my awful childhood it was the only way that I could cope um so when I first started writing Chinglish it started off as a funny book I just wanted it to just be funny that's all and then my agent because he knew the truth of my past and knew all the dark bits he asked me if I could put those in and I was really reluctant at first because it meant digging it all up again and Mm. um writing Mm. all down in detail and remembering every little bit and then my editor asked me as well, could you be more honest about this situation here and, you know, and this bit there? You know, they were saying you, I, that I could be helping quite a lot of readers if mm. they could relate to these situations and they've, if they've been through them themselves or are currently going through them, they could look at that and think that they're not the only ones. And that was the only thing really that made me think, well, yeah, OK, then I will... I will mm. write the truth. Mm. Even no matter, you know, it, it it wasn't easy, but I thought that the task of actually helping people was more important than the pain that I was going to go through to write it because in actual fact it became a kind of therapy anyway. Mm. Um it was quite cathartic. There was a lot of incidents from the past that I'd already dealt with anyway because I've actually had therapy to to get over it a lot of it, but there were still some um parts that were very very kind of embedded deep down that really needed lots of digging out um that I didn't even realize were there um so it's all out now and it's all out it's all out in the book but like you say it's not all doom and gloom 
I'd like to think that overall it's a very funny book yeah. and it's it's a lot of people have come back to me and said it's hilarious yeah we're yeah. going to start with a funny reading actually aren't we so can you just set up this piece for us yes yeah, so in amongst the mayhem of the Chung family living in a takeaway we actually managed to keep pets as well and um a lot of them ended up with um unfortunate kind of endings um <laughs> not due to us but due to a variety of situations um but this was uh, one of the situations and um my sister was very fond of hamsters she always kept hamsters and this one didn't last very long but um I'll, I'll read the extract and, uh, and then you'll find out why. So, Tuesday 14th of August. Was concentrating sketching an oak leaf in fine liner when I heard Bonnie screaming in our room. I burst in and found her holding the vacuum cleaner which was still on. What happened? I just hoovered up the hamster, she shrieked. I went over, switched it off at the mains and glared at her as in, how the hell? I couldn't be bothered to clean out the sawdust properly, so I took off the brush attachment and stuck the nozzle through the hatch, she gabbled. So I wrestled the vacuum cleaner open, pulled out the dust bag and tipped the contents onto the floor. Hammy rolled out, stiff as a board. (gasps) Oh my God, I whisper shouted. You've killed him. I wasn't sure what to do. Haven't been so traumatised since Hazel got shot in Watership Down. So I prodded the lifeless corpse a few times. It didn't move. Right, well, you killed him so you can bury him, I said. Can you help me? said Bonnie. Why should I? Because you know how to use a spade. We don't even have a spade. Well, how are we going to bury him then? said Bonnie. I think you mean, how am I going to bury him? Yeah, that's what I said before. How are you going to bury him? This futile discussion went on for a bit, and I was slightly crapping myself about what Dad would do if he walked into the room that second, till I noticed Hammy moving. Well, more like erratic twitching, really. So I made Bonnie pick him up and put him back in the cage. I didn't want to touch him, as I'm not sure if rodents harbour fatal diseases after coming back from dead. Then we closed the hatch and tried to forget about it, in the hope that Hammy would too, although not entirely sure he will, considering this must have been the look on his face the moment he got sucked up. So I've got to say as well that I've illustrated the... I did all the illustrations in the book as well. Yeah, Yeah, so that was the end of Hammy. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) There's another story... Um where a hamster gets sucked up a vacuum cleaner, a fictional one by Kate, uh, de, Mac- Kate de Camilla. I don't know if it's... Is it a hamster? Hamster-like creature, oh, might right. be a gerbil, called Flora and Ulysses. Oh, oh yes, I've heard of that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. One of the really positive things uh, in the story is the relationship with the brother, Simon, your brother, yeah. uh, in fact, yeah. um, which seems like a, a life-saving relationship, actually. Yes, um, so I think because we were born a few years apart than me and my little sister, so mm. we were much closer growing up. Um, so we shared a lot of experiences um, up until the point when he moves away with my grandparents, and that's when we kind of have been separated, and we never really kind of lived together again after that. But he's always, up till now... Um, always been the one that has supported me about my pe- with my parents. We've supported each other really because uh, we've both been through really bad times with them, and we both laugh it off now. Mm. And we both um, we're both over it. Um, but my little sister, there's six years between us, whereas with my brother, I think there's only three. Um, so there's a bit more of a gap between me and my little sister. So I left home while she was still at home. So then she wasn't with me anymore and she had to kind of cope with my parents on her own for a bit. So, yeah, even though my brother now lives in Oregon, just in the States, just knowing that he's there helps me feel better about having my parents. Mm. We haven't really talked about the sort of detail um, of why that was difficult. I mean, one of the issues was around communication um, and there were all sorts of reasons why that was difficult. Perhaps you could give yeah. us an insight into that. Yeah, sure. So, again, a variety of reasons why that was difficult. Um, one of them being that my parents were the kind of parents that didn't really talk to their kids on any kind of conversational level whatsoever. So there was never any, oh, how was your day today? What do you want for dinner? Any Anything like that. Um, the only 
things they would really say to us is when they wanted us to do something in the kitchen, they wanted to serve a customer, they wanted us to peel onions, mop the floor, kind of ordering us about, really. Or my dad shouting at us and swearing at us, they were the only kind of communication that we ever had with our parents. And also, another factor was that for some unknown reason, they chose to speak the Hatgar dialect out of all of our friends and family who all spoke Cantonese, which is the main dialect that British Chinese people speak. So which they, is from Hong Kong. Which is from yeah. Hong Kong. Uh, Macau, that kind of area. Yeah, yeah. Hatgar is also um, Hong Kong Chinese, I think, but but it's very rarely spoken. Right. Um, so you very rarely very hear different? it about. Um, yeah, I would say some of the words you can recognise, it's almost like if you did GCSE level French, you can recognise, if someone's talking to you in French, you can recognise a few words. Right. Yes. It's the same with Hatgar and, and Cantonese. If someone was speaking Cantonese to me, I would recognise a few words right. only. I wouldn't be able to have a conversation with them. Well, I couldn't have a conversation anyway because I can't speak <laughs> Chinese and that's that's the other, re- that's the other just... factor. Yeah, so... My, our parents never bothered teaching us Hakka Chinese. Not that it would have been much use anyway, because it's a very rarely spoken dialect, but it meant that we couldn't co- uh, communicate with them directly. So mm. we couldn't have a full-on conversation with our parents, ever, and st- still can't. So we ended up just not knowing anything about our past, uh, our family history. We would never really connect us at any kind of level, deep level. Mm. What about with the grandparents? Because... Uh... Your grandparents also feature in here yes. came over at the same time as your That's right, parents. they did, yeah. So they immigrated over in the 60s as well, my parents. They spoke even, well, they hardly speak any English at all. My granddad spoke a little bit. Um, my mum hardly speaks any English, even after being here since the 60s. She, again, it comes down to the whole being trapped inside mm. the, the Chinese takeaway and not being able to get out. Um, whereas my dad, I think, went to spent his last years of college or university in England, so mm-hmm. his English is quite good, but he doesn't like talking anyway. So it was this, and that's why the kind of the book I called it Chinglish because it was just a mishmash of uh, English and Chinese that we were bandying around, trying to communicate with each other the whole time. Um, I mean, my level of Chinese now is kind of toddler level. I can put a point across very basically and try and get it understood but there's no way that I could ever have a conversation Mm. with anybody um, Mm. in Chinese the book starts um, in a way that uh, I think I said to you earlier when I was reading it I thought I could read this with you know a nine year old to ten year old but gradually as we go deeper into the story it becomes apparent to me that that isn't the case because there's a there is at the heart of this an abusive and a violent relationship with yes. your father. Was that really hard to write about? It was very reluctant. I didn't really want to write about that side because it meant I was going to have to dig it all back up again when I'd spent so many years burying it. Um, While you've still got family around as well. I mean, yeah. that's also another complication, isn't it? It's not like yes. somebody, when their yeah. family's gone and you suddenly feel that release and you can yeah. write about it, that yeah. must also have been... A consideration. It was a consideration. There was lots of mixed feelings about it because, you know, my mum can't speak in or read English, so I knew that, you know, if she saw the book, she wouldn't understand it anyway. Uh, my dad, if he'd got a hold of the book, I didn't know if it would make matters worse within the family. But then I was thinking, well, things couldn't really get much worse. I mean, I'm estranged from my parents, so I hardly ever speak to them anyway. I just don't think. To be honest, I'm not quite sure what his response would be. But I've actually shown him in a good light as well as, mm. as telling the truth about the, uh, the abuse. Mm. But it's, uh, it helped me, um, in the end, putting it all down on paper. And I actually spoke to another author who went through a similar experience in her childhood. And she actually helped me by saying that this is my story to tell. And I, I, so I deserve to tell it. And that kind of like got me through, really. Because I was at one point I was going to throw the towel in and you know I really didn't want to go through with this because it because it'll be I mean there are other family members including my brothers and sisters there's a few aunts and everything that can read English and that probably will read the book um how will it affect them it's like airing your dirty laundry isn't it so I just just went and did it I I was just brave and did it 
and hopefully I'll be helping more people and that's kind of like my reasoning behind doing it really mm, yeah um you said something really interesting there uh, about portraying your dad in a good light to showing the positive and the negative was that an adult understanding that actually people are complex and that you wanted to show it in that way rather than your teenage self do you think that you have that understanding as a as a teenager or do you think that that's come with reflection oh no no it, I, I didn't have that understanding as a teenager at all all I thought back then was just how to survive how to get through this um, it's only on reflection mm. that I realised that my parents could only do what they could at the time I would never have been wise enough to know that back then um, I only know now um, that after having all the therapy and I read a lot of self-help books and everything now as well um, that I realised well, you know, that I've forgiven them for what they did because they didn't know any better We've got a second reading, which is yeah. from this second half of the book, really. Well, it's yes. not it's a book in two halves, but, you know, when we're fully aware, really, of the, the difficulties within the family. Yeah, so this um, extract that I'm going to read now is um, kind of details the dysfunction that goes on within the family, um, within the, the Chinese takeaway setting, anyway. So, and I, I don't really know the legalities of it these days, but back then, when I started serving customers, I was about... 11, 12 years old. I and think I you would... probably weren't allowed to, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It was such a Bavarian commentary that no one would have really um, said anything anyway. Um, and it meant serving the drunks as well when they came out of the pub at you know 11 o'clock and everything, which was quite traumatic. Um, so anyway, this is involves my older brother, Simon. Friday, 11th of July. Simon was round for dinner tonight, Halfway through, Mum turned to him and said in Chinese, You know I'm having a baby? Yeah, Simon grunted uncomfortably. And the takeaway is getting busy, Mum continued. Simon didn't look up. He was suspicious. I could tell he knew she was going to ask him for something, most likely to help out in the takeaway. The thought of it makes him feel sicker than it makes me. He is dead set on getting a normal Western job like I am. Well, Mum went on, It'd be really great if you could start helping out occasionally. Eek! She'd said it. Me and Bonnie squirmed. Simon looked on the brink of an outburst. We'd pay you, said Mum, in a lighter tone, hoping that will change his mind. More silence, then. I've just finished my exams. Give me a break, Simon hissed. I think the comment Mum made ages ago about him being able to buy clothes instead of stealing them was also on his mind. Can't you spare a few hours a week, Mum went on a bit more irritated this time. Me and Bonnie glanced at each other, willing it to stop. No, he snapped. Then Dad intervened. He scraped back his chair and stood up. You do what we tell you! Simon was stony-faced. He slammed down his bowl, spraying rice everywhere, and stood up too. He was taller than Dad. He was 17, and not the defenceless little kid that got sent away anymore. I said no, he boomed. I knew this could explode into something much, much worse. We all did. We'd all been there before, in the wrong place at the wrong time, when Dad was in destructive mode. Don't be silly, sit down, Mum said, flapping her hands at them both. Simon glowered and left. Then Bonnie ran away to Mandy's. Mum mumbled sadly. What kind of kids have I raised? And went to serve a customer who'd just wandered in, while Dad went to switch the extractor fan on, swearing under his breath. I trembled as I washed the chopsticks later. While Dad was in the loo, I asked Mum why they couldn't have done something other than run a Chinese takeaway. I don't know how to do anything else, she answered feebly. Dad's clever, he could have, I said. She ignored that, thought for a moment and replied simply, When we're dead, the takeaway's yours. I don't want the takeaway, I answered, offended. Well then you can marry David Wong from Wong's garden and inherit his parents' takeaway. You were forced to marry Dad, and look what happened to you! I wanted to scream, but I couldn't, because, one, it would have been well cruel, two, I didn't know how to say it in Chinese, story of my life. Why are they always forcing us to do stuff anyway? And why do they think the only future for us is in a Chinese takeaway? I have come upstairs to be on my own. I swore I wasn't going to put the crap bits of my life in this diary, but I am so angry 
and I need to get it out of my system. Yeah, I mean, that really highlights the void. The fact that that could be considered something to look forward to that you could inherit yeah. this takeaway yeah. given everything that you've uh, written about in there yes well I guess for people like my parents who gave up everything in Hong Kong and came over with nothing and started their own business and, were in, and entrepreneurs really you know it was a big deal for them to have done that and I totally admire them mm. for doing that coming over a completely different country and mm. starting a business that's an amazing thing to do but the children then went to school and they were educated and they saw other opportunities and they wanted to do something a bit better than work. 12 hours a day, 364 days a year uh, in a Chinese takeaway, serving junks and mm. <laughs> sweating behind a hob all day. Mm. Um, we, we just thought that there was better opportunities. Mm. and that, But they didn't know that because they hadn't been educated in that system. Um, and my mum... She once told me that she left school when she was 13 to look after her younger brothers and sisters. So mm. that's where her education ended. And um, so she, I don't think it, it's of any importance to her. She doesn't mm. understand how incredibly important education is for furthering yourself. Mm. And what's really great is that you go on to win a scholarship basically yes. competition, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. And what, what has that led to in your life? After my English teacher told me I was crap at writing, I then concentrated on my art instead and um, wanted to go to art college and ended up entering a competition in Ms. Magazine, which was like a teenage girls' magazine back in the day. And I ended up one of the finalists at London College of Fashion and uh, I won a place on their course, a uh, fashion styling course. And uh, that's when I decided that, that that was the best time to leave home and that was my only chance really so yeah I just skedaddled out of there mm. yeah yeah well congratulations on that I know it's Thank some time you. ago now yes, but it's it obviously was. led to great things um are there more books to come in a similar vein about your life do you feel that you've mined it all now and that you're going to move on to something else or is or is there something left over that you want to explore a little bit more there's actually been quite a lot of people who have asked if there's a sequel to Chinglish and to be honest I haven't really thought about it in fact I'm just trying to get over the <laughs> the emotion of writing Chinglish um, just to give myself a little bit of a break and then maybe I'll think about doing the sequel but just to warn people that the sequel will get much much darker uh, I mean the, the Chinglish ends on a high mm. and everyone everyone's thinking oh it's you know happy happily ever after ending but it actually goes right downhill after that and um i end up pregnant and living in a squat and there's really no humor there at all um so i'm not quite sure how to approach that just yet but at the moment i'm talking to publishers about an a uh, humorous illustrated series for mid-grade um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where I am at the moment. Mm. Yeah, It's been really great talking to you today, Sue. I'm so glad uh, to have met you and to have the opportunity to learn more about Chinglish. Thank you very much for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to In the Reading Corner with Just Imagine. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can find many more on the podcast section of our website, justimagine.co.uk, plus via iTunes or your usual podcast provider. Don't forget to pass the pod and recommend this fantastic free resource to your friends and colleagues. Just Imagine also has a free fortnightly newsletter packed full of the latest news, CPD training, reviews and giveaways. To sign up, visit justimagine.co.uk forward slash newsletter.